Um, but yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's wonderful to see everyone. Um, we are hot off the Idea Summit, of course, where Dr. Megan and Ramana um, had their fireside chat. And I think we're in such a great place to continue that conversation about intentionally engineering inclusion. Um, so I will pass over to Megan and the team and a huge thank you in advance as well. I'm so excited to see this part two. Thanks so much, Laura. I'm really excited to be back with you. I had a lot of fun um, meeting some of you last week in, um, at your headquarters, and I think the event went really well, and I was, uh, it was so, such a great honor to get to meet and to work with Ramana. Uh, so if you are new to this setting, my name is Megan Pollock. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. I, uh, my company is called Engineer Inclusion, and so you'll hear that language a lot and how we are really intentional and how we actively work to engineer inclusion. Um, I certainly come to this work as an engineer, and that's the lens that I bring to that. I want to also introduce my colleague to you, Kayla Maxey. Uh, she and I have similar backgrounds and the PhD programs that we um, attended at Purdue, and she is real close to finishing her uh, dissertation, and so we are cheering her on in those final steps. Um, and so she focuses her work on helping organizations similar to me to, to be really thoughtful and intentional about how to systematically make changes. Um, and so she also is an engineer. And so she has 10 years experience uh, working with uh, medical devices in the healthcare industry. You want to say hi, Kayla? Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see so many fam familiar faces. So I look forward to um, the session with you. Thanks. And we also have Casey Haig here. She is our colleague who's uh, running things in the background for us. Uh, so if you do have any technical issues, you can talk to Casey. And so when she is not a Zoom producer extraordinaire, uh, she is running her Two Friends Improv Theater in New Orleans. And so she's been teaching improv uh, since 2014 and performing since 2010. And so we're glad to have her here. Just just like we talked about last time, we want to give us a sort of frame of how we're going to engage today. And this is what I call our session, session pledge. Um, the page numbers that you see here, they are going to refer back to last month's handout. Again, trying not to overload you. Um, but again, that's just a reference to that. And then Casey will add more uh, references in the chat for you. So our request is that as we begin to operate together, that we think about, and, and this also is a really good practice for you to use on your teams, um, but every team naturally develops these sort of normative behaviors, expectations, and unwritten ways of operating. And so to intentionally engineer in inclusion, we can set or establish norms that, like these that scaffold equity and inclusive practices. And so the first thing I want to ask is that we stay engaged. I know y'all all have jobs. That's what brings us here today. But sometimes we need to try to set those things aside so that we can focus on what we've come here to, to accomplish together. Um, what we are able to do is really a function of the energy, the thoughts, and the expertise that you also bring to the space, particularly as we work in our breakout rooms. Um, so try to close out anything that's going to be a distraction to you and um, actively work to listen, especially when we're in those breakout sessions. Second reminder is to share the mic. Um, for people like me, we tend to have too much to say. So we wanna pause and step back and make sure that we're pulling people in from the margins and asking them what they think. And we wanna pay attention to people's body language. That's why the cameras are useful to see like maybe when they frown, maybe when they make a face and to, and to make sure that we're bringing their input into that space. Um, and so we, we as facilitators depend on you to help us do that because we can't be in all the rooms at the same time. The next thing we wanna encourage you to do is to support each other, right? We're here to be supportive. We're all here to learn. We're all here to honor each other on the journey that we find ourselves to becoming inclusive leaders. And so we wanna help each other navigate this content with kindness, patience, respect. Um, if you don't have, if you have questions, ask, right? Like let's clarify those things. You don't have to let those confusions sit. Um, this also means that we want to reject stereotypes. Um, we want to reject the ways that bias shows up in this place and really focus on, you know, unfiltered evidence when we can. Um, and finally, we want to stretch and reflect. And so what this means is that we are all accountable for our words and actions and that 
we want to be willing to be open to stretch and reflect on our own experiences and be willing to learn in this in the space. What I also want to remind you of is, you know, thinking about the spheres of influence originated by the Greek, you know, Stoic philosophers, uh, but popularized by Stephen Covey, is that there are some things that we can control, some things we can influence, and a lot that we cannot. So sometimes when we're doing this work, we kind of get stuck and like, oh, this is important. There are all these things. And the answer is yes, there are all these things, but we will never make progress if we get stuck out there. So like reel yourself back in. What can I control? What can I influence? And that's where we're going to make progress today. All right. So quick recap. What we did last time is we talked about what is an inclusive leader. We talked about how does one become an inclusive leader and, you know, inclusive leadership as we had defined it. It's the set of behaviors that all of us, whether you're a leader, a manager um, or an individual contributor, every one of us have these behaviors that can focus on facilitating group members feeling part of that group, that belongingness that we retain, that help people retain their sense of individuality while contributing to the group processes and outcomes. And we talked about how important this is and how it fits in the middle of our hierarchy of needs based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs published decades ago. And that our ability to belong and to fit into a space happens before we do any work, right? And so it's so important for us to think about this because it's what drives the outcomes, the organizational outcomes that we want. We can have all the productivity, all the big dreams, all the goals that we want, but unless we're taking care of our people, unless we're helping all of our people to feel like they fit in, that they belong, then, they, then they'll be able to drive those outcomes that we want. And it's just good to help people feel like they fit in. A couple of key things that we know is that inclusive leadership, it facilitates that belongingness. It helps people feel valued. It enhances performance, it improves collaboration, it boosts attendance, and it reduces turnover, especially as we're in this period of the great resignation. These are all good things. We, you know, it costs a lot of money to have staff turnover and we want to keep our good people with us. And so we want to begin to implement these practices. When we were together last time, we talked about the inclusive leadership development model and how it has four key parts and then some subparts underneath that. You also had an opportunity to reflect on your own growth along a continuum and reflect on that. And I hope that you had an opportunity to do so. Um, again, you can pull up the, the, the previous handout that's in the quick links that, that uh, my colleagues are dropping in the chat for you. We also introduced three different tools that you could think about and use understanding around the ways that cognitive biases happen in the workplace. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more today about this unbiasing method. And then we have the session pledge that you talked about. So what we're going to do first is I'm going to give you a chance to reflect a little bit. And I've got a couple of slidos, and then we're going to put you into some breakout rooms to allow you to discuss. Now, our original goal was, again, to put you in your team's but um, Casey's telling me that a lot of the people that are here are not on that team list. So I think we may just end up doing random groups if that's okay, Laura and Kimberly, because that's the best that we're going to be able to do. Okay. So what I want you to think about first is what's one thing that you've done as a result of what you learned from 3.9? If you were one of the few people that weren't with us on 3.9, uh, maybe think of something else that you've done related to inclusive practices. What's one thing you've done as a result of what you learn from 3.9. So this is a word cloud, so keep them simple so we can have some uh, consistency across here if possible. All right, so conversations. Sharing the mic, helping others' voices be heard. You attended the idea summit, that's great. Listening, yeah, one-on-one -on -one conversations, being a better listener. I love to hear all this about listening. That's great. What else? Thinking about bias. Maybe the bandwagon, maybe that's part of the, one of the cognitive biases. Uh, listening. We've got a lot of strength around that. Excellent.
for those of you who are talking about listening, I'd love to hear an anecdote from somebody like maybe how you listened differently over the last month and what changed as a result of that. So somebody share an experience the last month of when you listen differently and what changed as a result. Could be willing to share. Or maybe something that you did to elevate and get out of the way so other people can, their voices can be heard. What story you want to share? Megan, are you asking to share live or in, yeah, in yeah. Um, I can I can I, I was one of those people who also said listen. And I think uh, one thing that has really um, changed for me is obviously listening more, um, accepting uh, in terms of what they're they're saying, um, and also encouraging others to listen more. So I think that that would be my um, that would be my thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Is it is your name pronounced Suba? Shuba. That's right. It's Shuba. it's a yeah. shoebox without an X. So Shuba. Shuba. Thank you. Hey, thanks. <laughs> what else? Um, yeah, I'll share. Um, I, I also put listening. Um, and for me, it was interesting that it started to really unearth uh, the strengths of others while sitting back and listening you know, without kind of doing the talking and dictating, but really just listening and hearing it and really um, earning a lot more respect just from listening and seeing what people bring to the table. I love it. It gives me chills. <laughs> it's such a simple practice, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. Ricardo. Yeah, very simple, basic is the example. Just be more aware, right? Sometimes we have a big meeting like this and someone wants to speak, but they don't feel comfortable and they, they put on a chat, hey, this, this, right? Then, hey, uh, so I help bridge the gap. Hey, uh, so-and-so said something on a chat. So why don't you say it to everyone? It's like kind of facilitating people to have their voices uh, out there. That's great. Thanks, Ricardo. Yeah, so um, I, I personally love that language, bridging the gap, elevating people. You know, everyone has a voice. It's whether we choose to get out of the way of their voice and to elevate their voice so that others can hear it. So I thank you for that. All right, my next prompt for you, and this is gonna set us up, we're gonna go into breakout rooms, is I want you to personally reflect how satisfied are you with the progress that you've made towards becoming an inclusive leader. Now, again, 10 out of 10 doesn't mean like you're done. It just means you feel good about the effort that you put towards this over the last month. All right, we got um, first person jumps into the eight. So you've been doing some work. I love it. How satisfied are you with the progress you've made? And this just gives us a personal benchmark to think about, you know, maybe I didn't get to spend as much thinking about this. Um, we're aiming to create some shared language so that you all can continue this work um, and hold one another accountable in this as well. Get a few more people to participate on the poll. I love that no one's just straight up like, totally disappointed. So that's good news. That means you've all done a little bit of work. Um, and as, as you've described, it doesn't mean that you all went out and like you've read 20 books the last month. It means that you've, you've just changed a practice, started listening, focusing humans over, over some other priorities. Excellent. All right. Well, our rankings are slowing down. So I'm going to go ahead and move this forward. Thank you for contributing to that. For this first exercise that we're going to do when we put you into breakout rooms, uh, we're going to use the round robin brainstorming method. And we uh, introduced this last time. And so round, round robin brainstorming, it's an inclusive practice that ensures everyone is involved, that all ideas are shared, fostering greater creativity, innovation, and inclusion. And so um, what we'll do before we break you up is I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about and reflect, and you already have been doing that on some of your ideas before we start the round robin. When you get into your breakout rooms, you're going to create a sharing order and you're going to stick to that. And so, you know, 
Ricardo will say, I'm, I've been listening. Janine's going to say, I have been having one-on-one conversations. Laura, so you're going to have that sort of dropping out all these different I- ideas that, that add to the list. And then you can build on other ideas, but we don't want to cap, we don't want to critique or co- like have commentary on ideas yet. It's really a generative kind of exercise. And so this prompt that we have for you to start out with is what have you thought about noticed, discussed, or tried since our last meeting related to inclusive leadership. And what we're going to be using now is a, a different tool. It's called Padlet. And I've got four columns here and the columns scroll up and down um, once content is added. I've got the instructions here for you. The instructions are also going to be in the chat. So you'll have instructions wherever you go. If you need to pop open the um, inclusive leadership development model, you can just click on it there. And then to add a comment, um, you click the little plus sign here, and then you can type whatever content it is that you want to share. You can like something, you can um, you can add a comment to something that somebody else wrote. And so um, you, if there's something that doesn't fit one of these four columns, you can add other reflections. The green, that's just the definitions of each of these. And then once you make it through and your brainstorming kind of slows, we want you to start to kind of think about what are some takeaways? What are some things that you've discovered based on what all of you have come up with in this brainstorming exercise? And so um, with that, I'm gonna, we're gonna get your breakout rooms queued up and we're gonna put you in about uh, groups of five. Um, they'll be random. Um, and I will share the screen to get you started, but help everyone access that, um, breakout, access that padlet. Okay. So Casey, when you're ready, we can open up the rooms. All right. Have fun, everyone. See you back in 15 minutes. All right. Welcome back. Uh, As I popped into and listened in on your conversations, I was really encouraged. Um, I heard some really rich conversation about things that you have done, that you've tried, um, questions that you still have. And I want to give us uh, an open space here to debrief a little bit and to, to talk about what are some of the sort of sweeping takeaways from your conversations that, that you like to add and share with the whole group. So big takeaways from your conversation that you'd like to bring to the whole group. Yeah, make it all go for our team. Uh, the two that really, I think, stood out that we spent the most time talking about is, you know, viewing things through other people's lenses. Uh, Matthias in our group gave a great example with an iceberg on top. You only see a piece, but obviously everything you don't see. How do you really try to take account of of what else is there that you need to be aware of? And then I think the the other time, thing that we really kind of spent uh, some time talking about, um, not as much as I think we would have liked, but you know, depending on the team, right? It's it's we have different entities where we haven't fully integrated them within Fanatics yet. So culturally, there are differences. So really, just how do we one um, try to promote inclusiveness when we're already having to bring in a different culture into ours and make them feel welcome. And then two, just making the time to actually practice um, some of the learnings and opportunities because we're moving so fast is definitely something that we could definitely do a better job carving out some time for uh, just to make sure that we're doing everything to the best of our ability. Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. And, you know, there, there's no real simple answer to it because the whole practice of implementing practices is a practice. Um, I know that like sounds super meta, but like um, we have to begin to think about how we move through the world. And as we expand the way that we function, to me, it really comes down to core values. So as we internalize these ways of knowing and doing as our core values, they become something that we hold ourselves accountable to, right? And so when we begin to act in a way, and then I ask myself like, yeah, nope, this doesn't reflect my values. I need to shift here. I need to to model those values that I have determined to be most important to me. That becomes a practice. It's also really useful to surround yourself with people who help you learn what you don't know, right? Um, one of my weaknesses or opportunities for growth as a leader, as many of you are, I'm a trained engineer. And so in my baby engineer years, I learned how to like make an agenda, you work to the agenda and you just get to work. 
but Laura, Laura, I haven't told you this yet, but Laura is, has an incredible skill of like checking in on people first. And I'm always like, oh yeah, how are you? <laughs> because that's not my MO, right? My MO is like, let's get to work. Let's do the job. And Laura always reminds me like, oh yes, I'm good. Thank you for asking. And how are you doing? Right. Um, and so having other people around us that have these different practices, it helps us build those as well. What else, other key takeaways? Thanks for sharing that, Matt. Caitlin. Um, as we, uh, so one thing I took away from your last um, session was this definition of uh, inclusivity as being accepting to all different types and forms of authenticity versus feeling like inclusion means that you have to start uh, that click mentality of like, I need to, I need to fold into what is fanatics culture. I need to be a certain way to be uh, here at fanatics. And I feel like in some cases across my career, I've, I've even felt like I've been challenged on my authenticity and trying to overcome those feelings of like, oh crap, I went a little, I was a little too much myself today, or I've gone a little too um, oh, into that deep end of, of my personality. And um, I guess what I wanted to say about that is um, as leaders to just encouraging each other across, even not even just engineering, but even across into business units saying like, hey, I just want you to let you know, I know that that may have challenged you a little bit, me being my authentic self, but that's who I am. And that's how I'm, getting, that's how I'm approaching these problems. If there's ways that, you know, I can adapt to help, um, you know, help us come to a common place, then I'm happy to do that. But um, yeah, that one, that one struck me. I, I feel like whenever you join a, a company, you're, you're always encouraged to, to convert to the culture, but I, I don't think that's not what, what we want to do here. Thanks for sharing that and being vulnerable. You know, it reminds me of uh, Fantasy was with us last time. Today is her birth or tomorrow is her birthday. So she's on a cruise right now. So she couldn't join us. Um, okay. But one of the things that she's really skilled at is like, she does this thing where she's like, I see you. So when you have those moments of like being to yourself, like you're described, she has a way of just saying like, I see you and I love it, right? So rather than you sort of like curling back into yourself and being like, ugh, you know, like, what have I just done? Honoring that. And we can do that for one another. When someone is like, when we see their true selves shining through, celebrate it and help them see that you see it. And so that they feel more welcome to bring all of those parts of us to work. Yeah. And those things that you are when fantasy says I see it, it's usually the thing that complement your your heightened awareness to it is, is because it's either something that you've noticed that you don't necessarily maybe do well or you are um, maybe haven't noticed at all that someone else is doing. So the, I think that goes back to what Matt was saying of like and what Megan modeled with Laura of like picking up on I don't need to have everything because Caitlin has a piece of it and that is awesome because now I can go back doing the things I'm good at and I see you doing the things you're awesome at. I'm really awesome at coming up with great dad jokes um, if you ever need any or puns or metaphors so here for that. <laughs> Noted thanks Caitlin. Any other key points that came up for you all? I would steal this one from Guillermo. Uh, it's something he said was, I think was really solid. Um, we have been talking about listening and all, which is important, but he said, uh, listen to what is not being said, right? That's kind of profound and I really liked it. And we, we also talked about uh, really uh, trying to view others' perspectives in different cultures. Sometimes people are in different parts of the world, try to get an understanding and and uh, to not uh, make people uncomfortable. Uh, if you can know a little bit about uh, something you shouldn't be saying or uh, just uh, try to get a little understanding of the situation before you speak to it. Um, and uh, I think we talked about uh, helping others bridge the gap, communications and help other voices being, being heard. And I think that's the, these are my key ones. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ricardo. Yeah. So what's being said and what's not being said, whose voice is present and who's not. 
Those are really key questions. Those are great questions. All right, I'm gonna move us forward here to our last part of the, the exercise. And I want us to begin to think about how do we systematize these practices on our teams? So it's one thing for us as individuals to say, I wanna employ these things. I wanna to begin to, to practice some of these resources that we've shared. But until we begin to, to put something in place that helps us be accountable to it, it's harder to, to make the progress that we want. And so this is going to be the sort of guiding question for us. Um, Casey's going to put into the link in a little bit the instructions, but we're going to set us up a little bit. So what we have, I'm going to go over here a few examples of what each of these components do not look like. Okay. And so what in, what the individual, as we've talked about, like this is where we as people understand the social and political context and how it creates our identity, how it influences and biases our perceptions. So what this doesn't look like is someone who says, I'm just here to do a job, right? So it takes a human out of it. It also doesn't mean saying like, I'm tired of having to be politically correct. I think I used this example when we talked um, during the idea event last week of like, being politically correct is, uh, I think, a cop out to not, you know, wanting to care about other people's experiences, right? If you care about people and if you care about what people feel in the world around you, then you're thoughtful to the language that you use. And so it's not about that. So when you hear that language, that's someone saying, I'm, I'm not caring about understanding my identity and how it influences how I move through the world. Um, for many people, myself included, as growing up as a white person in a predominantly white, you know, community, I always thought I didn't have culture because culture was always something that had been assigned to people with black and brown skin. And so it wasn't until someone really challenged me to say, like, you do have culture that I really began to understand my culture as a Texan and as a Cajun and, and you know, how all of those things informed my lived experience. Mm -hmm. So those are key things. If you have someone who's moving through saying like, I don't have bias, like these are not what this practice looks like. So some of the questions that we have for you to think about and how you can employ and systematize this set of values and way of knowing and doing into your work are how are you collectively encouraging one another to reflect on your identities and then how are you inviting dialogue that collectively expands everyone's social consciousness and explains how our identities bias our perceptions and outlooks? The next is the lens. Um, so what this doesn't look like are when we make statements um, like women aren't interested in tech careers or they, meaning any they, just don't succeed in that type of role, or they didn't ask for more. Um, that explains systemic sort of pay gap issues, right? When we have statements like this, so interest isn't a root cause. When we say, well, no women applied, that's the reason isn't because they're not interested. There are reasons or lots of barriers that they faced before you got to look at resumes, right? So um, when we make assumptions that people can't succeed in a role because they have families or kids, like these are systemic inequities and barriers. So some of the questions that we can ask ourselves is how do we use root cause analysis to understand and reveal the inequities that marginalized people are facing? How are we considering, how are we considering the institutional barriers and mar that marginalized and minoritized people face in the workplace and how are we removing them and then like adding the supports that they need to be successful, right? Um, and what ways are we establishing guardrails um, that attempt to protect us from those biased decisions, policies, and practices? So we have those cognitive biases tools that we, that we introduced. Kayla, jump in at any point here if you want to add on. Um, the next are examples of what the practices do not look like. So practices, that's the human-centered approach and being accountable. So we, when you hear language that says, well, that's not how we do it. That is status quo 101. Um, that is not centering humans. That's centering um, the conditioned things that you've done. When you or someone says, that's not what we meant, when you get defensive, when someone says, hey, this affected me in a way, when you or anyone, not you, but when anyone reacts and says, oh, that's not what I meant, the proper response would be like, oh, wow, I'm so sorry that affected you. Thank you for sharing that with me. I'm going to do better, right? Um, or when we say things like, don't be so sensitive, 
Like those are really dismissive languages that are not modeling these. So the questions that we can ask, and I think that a, a, a lot of what y'all were talking about are really falling into these practices and outcomes. How are we shifting our mindsets to value and elevate different ways of knowing and doing? How are we celebrating differences rather than suggest, suggest people hide and avoid them? And then finally, how are we practicing visible accountability for mistakes, failures, and mishaps? And this is so critical, particularly for you, for you who are in, are in leadership positions. If we don't practice visible accountability, how on earth are we going to expect people who work with us to do that, right? We have to be accountable. So if we make a mistake, and by the way, you will, because you're human, own up to it. Make it a teachable moment and say, you know what? I learned this. Thank you so-and-so for helping me to understand. Thank you for increasing my awareness. I want to do better. I welcome you to help challenge me in anything moving forward. And the last one is uh, the outcome. So what this does not look like. Um, so if someone repeats or rephrases something that was said for someone else and then gets credit for it, like raise your hand if this has happened to you. It's happened to so many of us, right? Um, <laughs> Or we say something like, well, they didn't say anything, so they must be fine. Or they always go along with what we usually do. So it's not a big deal to just keep doing, right? So they didn't interrupt us, so let's just keep going. Um, language that says, like, that's not very professional. Um, Kimberly and I were talking about this earlier this week of, like, what's professional? Who decides what's professional? Who's, who's our norm and what are we baselining? And, like, does it really matter? Um, and then Kayla reminded me this morning of the one, you are so articulate, um, said to me as a white woman, that doesn't mean the same thing that Kayla might hear to her as a black woman. Right. Um, and that one also sometimes raises different feelings, especially for individuals that might be in predominantly English speaking cultures now, but that was not their native tongue originally. So just being mindful that even though likely intended as a compliment, it can have a negative impact. Yeah, thanks. And so finally, the prompts here, and then we're going to get us going. Um, so in what ways are we actively listening? So y'all, many of you are talking about listening. So you're like becoming listening champs. And I'm excited to share a bunch of listening resources with you all afterwards, because it sounds like something that, that you really latched on to. So how are we actively listening to those marginalized voices and striving to incorporate their ideas? And how are we evaluating and refreshing our team norms so that more people authentically engage? So if you remember, we talked about last time, this sort of idea of nudges. So nudges, and I love this book from Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. So nudging is that process of influencing our behavior through small changes and in information or adaptations to our environment. And so what we want you to do is to incorporate nudges into how you operate as a leader and as a team. So these nudges, many of the resources that I've shared can be nudges, or you can create some new norms of like, hey, at the beginning of our team meetings, we want to have a session pledge. We want to check in on those cognitive biases. We want to, you know, evaluate the way in which we all engage and show up. However, those nudges look like, we want you to think about how you're going to employ them to begin to incorporate these practices. And so we're gonna go into um, some action planning now. And when we put you in your groups, um, I think we'll go ahead and just shuffle the groups here again. But what we want you to do is to access the planning Padlet. So that's the second link on the quick links. And so this one looks similar, but different. You'll notice on the tab, it has a little brain up there rather than um, the light bulb. And what I have here is I've copied the content I just shared. So the red is, those are the, what it doesn't look like. The blue are the planning prompts. And so this is a lot of content for you to dive into, but we're going to give you again, 15 minutes, but we want you to start somewhere in the group and begin to make some progress um, on, on at least one of these. And so again, how will you systematize inclusive leadership practices on your team? And again, it turns out we're not able to put you in your teams the way that we wanted. Um, so just do the best that you can um, with whoever you're grouped with. Does this work? One other thing okay. I wanted to add was that don't feel like you need to do all of these. 
if your group is finding like a cohesion around individual or lens or practice, one of those groups, spend your time there and really focus and deep dive into like how you can actually create those either practices or outcomes into um, your organization. So don't feel like you have to do like a breath. You can definitely deep dive into one, one channel here. And Kayla, you also had a great idea about big ideas, little um, ideas. You want to talk to that? Oh, yes. And the other thing is you can think about continuum. So I, we both understand being in this work that sometimes being like, hey, we're doing systemic change. And you're like, whoa, that's a lot of things. <laughs> We've heard you guys have sentiments of, you know, it's complex, it's hard, it takes a while, it takes a lot of energy. So really start to think about like, what are maybe some of those things we can do relatively quickly, low energy, you know, low resource but big impacts. And then what are some of those things that we might need to plan or stretch over the next year, right? High recess loads, um, still high impact, but was going to require more people than maybe just a couple. It may require more milestones along the way. And you can talk about both of those so that you have kind of a continuum of stretching you from not just today, but through um, your next years of strategic planning. Thanks, Kayla. And so I've added already a couple of resources here to, to help. Um, I've got a couple more that I just thought of that I will add here. So these are just resources that you can come back to. Again, you don't have to use for this exercise, but they're just tools to help you think. All right. So Casey, if you'll get the open up the groups, um, we'll see you all back and we'll check in in about 15 minutes. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. I was able to make it to all but one group, and I'm sorry I missed you. Um, and I heard some great ideas thinking about how do you not only begin to implement some, some normative behaviors that model the practices that you want, uh, but also talking about how do you get that to trickle down to, to the rest of your team so that they find those also normative. So let's do a little bit of a debrief um, on some of the key takeaways, bright ideas that you had from your group. And if you didn't get a chance to capture those on the Padlet, I encourage you to do so, so that you have those for posterity. Any big ideas? So uh, when we were talking, a lot of it had to do with who is involved in the meetings and ensuring kind of relationships between individuals, both before, during, and after, um, having kind of talks with people to ensure engagement. And then during the meeting, trying to put forward a norm where if you're on the meeting, everyone there has a chance to talk trying to time box that a little bit but also making sure that when we listen we're giving full attention to the person who is talking and or presenting yeah eric i love it so key so it's not just giving people space it's making sure that they're being heard and paid attention to because that can backfire really fast if we all just like get on our little phones and and we're not tuning in. Thanks, Eric. What else? Some other ideas. While y'all are thinking, I will piggyback on Eric and say meetings are great places to practice inclusive leadership. There's a lots of ways to kind of practice these without you're going to have meetings. We all know that, right? We sit in them most of our days, but to pick one and maybe practice in each of those meetings um, is a great way to exercise that muscle and make it more normative. Okay, other ideas? I guess it's a question I have maybe then Kayla to tack onto that. So we talk a lot about it being in meetings and like talking, but how do you bring that into even your workplace communications, like within Slack or email? How do you create that sense of inclusion? Is it like, you know, adding somebody on an email and asking for their opinion? Like what, what are some good tools you've seen? I mean, depending, I don't, I'm, I, let me back up. I'll preface this with the fact that I am of the school of thought to include the people that need to be included, right? Everybody is extremely busy. You guys talked about how fast paced it is. So including everyone might not be necessary. 
not because we don't need everyone's voice, right? There's other ways to capture channels for people that are at the periphery of that. Um, I would say from a meeting standpoint, I know someone said like go first, ways to share that in meetings is allowing different people to lead different meetings. Even if it's the same team member, you don't have to be the person leading every meeting. Collaborative agendas. You can set up the template and commit that everyone shares before Thursday, and then we have our meeting on Friday, right? Like that's another way. Um, Eric mentioned letting, you know, the round robin technique, which allowing everyone to speak before we engage in an active discussion. For me as a leader, when I am, especially when I'm in meetings with power differentials, I actually like to go last because what that allows is it, it shares the space, the airspace. I'm going to talk. Likely if you're the project lead or someone in some power position, you have kind of this authoritative and that redistributes that power to say others should be contributors um, as well. So those are some techniques that you can use in meetings. There's a ton others um, that we can also, I'll put some in the chat as other people are thinking, but I want other people to have an opportunity to debrief as well. So just, just like last time, I'm willing to stay on and talk longer, but I do want to be respectful for those of you who benchmarked 90 minutes for this. Um, it is important and all opportunities to learn that we do take a minute to reflect before we move on and shift gears. So I take a minute um, to reflect on three things that you learned, two things that you want to do differently, and one immediate action item. Um, you're going to have, again, I'll share all the, the resources that, that, that have been shared with you as a follow-up, um, and then we'll be able to continue to encourage and support you in that. Um, so take a minute to do this, and then we still welcome some report outs. Um, uh, Casey also put in the link a chat in the in the chat a link to evaluate the session. I truly welcome and appreciate your feedback. It helps me improve services for your groups and other groups like yours. So thank you for that. Um, any other takeaways from your group? Um, it's given me this great idea, great idea. I think all my ideas are great, but um, it's given me an idea to um, curate a list of, of how, of some practices that systematize these. Um, and so I'll be working on that. And so um, it won't be tonight, but if you join my mailing list as I create those, um, you'll be able to, to, to gather those and try them out in your practice. Any other takeaways? So Dr. Pollock, I have one question. It's a, it's not a takeaway. We talked about books like Nudge and Drive. Uh, there is a recent book called Amp It Up by Frank Slootman. Now, I, I if you have not read it, then that's fine. But I would like to know your point of view about that book. Because it is all so about amped? Amp It Up by Frank Slootman, who started this company called Snowflake. And it's a hundred billion dollar, I mean, even more market cap company in a short amount of time. And if you read that book, you just feel that it's all about winning and nothing else. So I have so, not, go ahead, Megan. I was going to say, well, so what do you think about it? I haven't read it. Um, so if, if what's the, your reaction to that bit, book and go ahead, Kayla, as well. No, I just felt that yeah, the kind of approach that was projected there was unsustainable. And uh, maybe it doesn't go with values of a lot of people. But then, yeah, if you have to survive in a competitive market space when you are working for a company which, uh, which has its own constraints, then how can you balance both these things out? Because sometimes you want to practice a lot of things, but then you are under too much constraint that you have to deliver things on time with the least amount of resources possible. And while our leaders can say, yeah, you have to prioritize, we can take some things away, but sometimes all of that, nothing can be taken away because somebody on top has decided that. Well, I wish Ramana was here because I heard him say last week that he truly believes that it is impossible for you all as an organization to scale without prioritizing people and inclusive values. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree. So you might have, you know, 
a different kind of unicorn in the sense of, of funding, but like a unicorn, like this company that you're talking about, that maybe they could scale and leave all the people behind, but it is not sustainable, right? Like I, I, I haven't read a book, I haven't heard about, about it, but um, to, to be inclusive is not at the expense of progress. To be inclusive is a value that enhances progress. And until we can shift our mindset to see that as that core value that it is, that it's not something else, like this is the thing that drives us to, to create the outcomes that we want, um, they're always going to be intention, like an in, intention. Um, and so to me, it's that mindset shift of how do I begin to shift the way that I'm looking at this and thinking about this to see that like this isn't something else. This is the thing. Yeah, it's an interesting point, and that I was just looking at the book. Uh, so it's about leading for hyper growth by raising expectations, increasing urgency, and elevating intensity, which that uh, echoes our environment, um, our a lot of areas of our environment on a regular basis. And so I think it is, if you're working in that environment, how do you balance inclusivity um, in high demand? So I have not read this particular book of his, but I have followed him in some other platforms, especially when Snowflake started kind of ramping and gaining its notoriety. Um, what I will say, and it sounds based on talking with y'all, that raising expectations are never a problem, right? Having high expectations are actually good. When we have low expectations, people it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The question is, what are those expectations and who do those expectations include or exclude? Depending on how we create those standards, we can either invite more people in or we can push people out. And so I think it's interrogating that piece based on what I'm hearing y'all say about your work environment and what I heard you, some groups talk about on their, um, I don't remember what the survey is called, but it sounded like a engagement type feedback survey. Burnout is real. <laughs> And when people are burnt out, they are not effective. And so I think one of the things I would caution, not because you can't do this model for some periods of time, it may not be a model that you do 24 seven, right? There might be times where we have to be hyperactive in a way to get work done. But if we're constantly practicing this value of inclusion, that muscle is gonna work in tandem. It doesn't just get sit on the shelf in hyperactivity, right? So it's it's a balancing act as with anything, but I think if you're only thinking about raising expectations, increasing urgency and elevating intensity, burnout will continue to rise in that way as well. Yeah, I would, I would counter, there's a CEO named Bob Chapman and he runs a company called Barry Way Miller and it's, you know, it's, it sounds like almost the opposite kind of mentality. Obviously, I've not I've not read this book, but um, I've read Bob Chapman's book, and you know it's more about inclusivity and making making the people rely upon each other rather than their boss. And really, it's just yeah, it's in my opinion a really uh, really interesting kind of I'd call it a social experiment, I guess. But you know, the success speaks for itself to show that how inclusive leadership really can work and making people work for each other instead of for a stock price or, or their boss or because they don't want to get fired or whatever it may be. Well, I think when you look at high performing teams in sports, like oftentimes that to, is the key difference of the, they give for each other um, and that really elevates them to a top level. One of the, it's, it's not a takeaway, but it's a question, Megan, is um, when I was reading one of the prompts, it says, you know, how do we, in what ways are we actively listening to marginalized voices to uh, and strive to incorpor incorporate that ideas? One of the things that came to my mind immediately is uh, there's biases in identifying marginalized voices as well. So um, should we take that out and just say, how do we just listen to people and then incorporate their ideas? Because they're, I think in today's world, everybody is marginalized in one form or the other. And, and it depends on their own perspectives. Um, that reflected, I think it would be good to um, listen to you on how do you think, what is your lens through which that question or prompt was put there? 
Yeah, so the definition that I use with marginalized are people who've historically been marginalized by the the this the government systems that are in place when like hierarchies of power and so it is really clear to understand who's been marginalized so if you are someone from any population that doesn't have you know if you if you aren't christian if you aren't male if you aren't white if you aren't heterosexual you know all of those things have power and so anyone within some of those populations has the potential to have been marginalized right acknowledged or not and so when we think about how are we incorporating those marginalized voices it doesn't just it doesn't mean saying like dear black person please speak up for all black people that's not what it's saying right it's saying, how are we just being really thoughtful to your point, Jeevan, of just of, of really listening? But what we have to pay attention to is, um, is it's easy for us when we get into those dominant ways of operating that we don't even see the people who are like literally sitting on the margins. Maybe they're not at the table. Maybe they're sitting in the back of the room and, and they become almost invisible to us, right? Because they, they are literally pushed in the corner to the margins. So that's where we have to be thoughtful to how are we actively giving people the seat at the table? How are we actively making sure that they have time at the mic and we're listening? And so it's, it's, it doesn't mean, and somebody brought this up, like it doesn't mean that everyone has to be involved in every decision. That's not what inclusiveness means. Y'all are still a business. You're still, you know, have to make progress. But to Kayla's point is how are we making sure the people who need to be a part of this are being a part of this, but also how are we deciding who needs to be a part of it? Yeah. So if you have a team of people who are making decisions for people who are traditionally marginalized or excluded, but yet they're not at the table, that's a problem, right? So how are you making sure that you've got the proper stakeholders in place? And this, this takes tons of thoughtfulness. Who needs to be involved? How are we making sure that we have that diversity around the table that's gonna give us the solutions that we need? And so I, I hope that answers your question, but really it's just that thoughtfulness to who needs to be involved. Um, it's really pushing on the old boys network of like, let me just call my five friends because we're really good at making decisions and moving fast. How do I challenge that a little bit to say, how am I bringing in different voices? Because they're going to add value and help us all meet those goals that we want. Yeah, it, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a good question. It makes you think because um the perception of that question will change depending on the environment to your point right like in the in the meeting that you're sitting in on and the people that is around that table it changes and it's it's good to see through that lens and constantly question yourself through those other parameters that you provided to say am i not including somebody that i should um mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I heard in Something. some of the groups, as you guys talked about, like the global nature of your organization brings in this different cultural differences in a lot. And some of the groups were talking about silence, right? And yeah. not ignoring the silence. And so as Megan said, it might be someone physically retreating, but it might just be in a pattern of silence um, that you can start to target different awareness levels or different integration or engagement in that. So in the more ways that you can incorporate, again, I feel like I'm overusing the term normative kinds of like intentionally normative behaviors where you say at the end of every meeting, we're going to go around the room and everybody's going to have a say, or at the beginning of the meeting, we're going to have at the beginning of every team meeting, we're going to have three people report something great that's happening in their life. Um, you know, so it humanizes it. You're making space for everyone to have a voice. Um, when you build, um, there's another practice I, I like called I heard. And so, you know, at the end of every meeting, you can have three I heard. So I can be like, you know, I heard Kayla say this today and I thought that was really spectacular. Then Caitlin says, well, I heard Ron say this today and I thought it was spectacular. So that's elevating things that we might not have, uh, that might not have been heard. Um, but it's, and it's also giving us that accountability to like, to pay attention and to, um, to honor what other people are saying. Um, and so different kinds of practices like that, people, people like routine, um, and you can 
build in those routines so that people look forward to them and um, and they again meet hit all these values that were that they were aiming to accomplish. Um, and and something, Kayla, you just said, and I may have misunderstood you, but silence is really uncomfortable to me. <clears throat> How many other people find silence really uncomfortable? There are some people who like if they're really introverted that they need like silence to like process before they speak. And so people like me who are like, what? you know, like I'm going to jump in and interrupt. Like I need to learn to be comfortable and just sit in it and let those people who need a minute to process have the space that they need to process. As teachers, as educators, we're learned to like wait 15 seconds, uh, or at least that's what I was taught. 15 silent seconds is real hard. But that's what you can do as a manager. Like when you ask a question, it's the same thing. You're just making space for people to think. Put it out there and wait. Say, I got all day. I mean, you may not have all day, but like let people think and give them that space. Don't rush. How do you feel about in meetings also stating you may not have the answer today, you know, get back to me tomorrow. Um, I know definitely as I appear as an extrovert, but I'm actually very introverted in that I need to like take it back and kind of like think about it. Um, so creating that safe space too to give people that time to marinate on things. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> And those are also tools if you for in the individual work like that's a great tool from a managerial down but that's also something you can say in out of your individual work of like I know I need space to process this so things that rise to this level and I'm unsure on how the recessors work I'm going to say in this meeting hey I need time to think about that give me 24 hours so like I especially early in my career I used to prep responses going into meeting as an introvert as someone who needs time to process on like how would I come out of that and but that comes in that individual work as well but they're definitely tools that I have now used on the managerial side of recognize that other people might need that space as well Again, complementary inclusive practices is how do we give people space to tell us what they need? Ron, you, you unmuted, what were you gonna add? I just, you know, we talk a lot about the, the office space and meetings and things like that. And, and sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll say that uh, when you, you know, if you go into our fulfillment centers or our call centers and you kind of look at how different those places obviously operate, but also how differently we treat the people that work in those places it's kind of it bothers me a lot personally um just the fact that we make people get patted down and go through metal detectors to come to work just doesn't seem like how can that create an environment of trust when we're telling you as soon as you walk in yeah you work here but we don't really trust you well it also i think the interesting thing on that one for me it tells me that you protect me as an individual so, I mean, there's two, I've it's walked a good it, point. I used to be a, it's a good point. Yeah. Um, so one was about stealing. I, I used to work at UPS and so we had to go through metal detectors for that. The other one was just uh, from a violence perspective and, and that, that's just uh, another lens um, on, on that topic. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. <Jeanette. laughs> and that, um, what Megan just put in is what I was going to say. So I'll, I'll tell you my experience of walking to the manufacturing plant for the first time um, on my first job. I was coming from the R&D and I was one of three black women and probably five women in the whole building, right? The building took up two blocks <laughs> and there was five of us. Going to the manufacturing facility for me was 96% black and brown people. And to the point that I actually named it the plantation at times when we, when I was talking to others about where I was going, because that's the way it felt. It felt like we weren't, we were adequate enough to make instrumentation, but we weren't adequate enough to be seen in our engineering environment. And so if that would have been, fortunately for us, our instrumentation was almost too big to steal. Um, but I could only imagine how that would have been compounded 
if I had to then go through a medical de metal detector as well. So I think there is two sides to every corn and the lens can look very differently. I would say Meg, Meg, to Megan's point of like, is there an underlying assumption of who's violent and who steals based on the makeup of the group that may be working in that environment versus the makeup working in other places? Great call out. And it's, uh, didn't provide the context. Like we, like, uh, the, we had offices flood because, uh, people were shoving boxes down the toilets. Um, and then, uh, that they, we've, we had some fight, some significant fights, uh, in the, in the parking lots and threats. So, um, super great call out from that, from a context perspective. And then on the other side of the coin in a, um, corporate environment. I had one company where there was a round of layoffs. They had guards at the door and I didn't make sense to me. And it was about that. It was the realization for me. It's about protecting everybody else. And then a different company totally did the same thing with no protection. And then I, it was like, I recognized like, I like, Hey, you guys might want to value the people who are here. And so it, it was just an interesting dialogue. Um, and eye opening for me. I didn't think about it from the pr protecting everybody uh, within the build within the building and space. You know, it, what, one of the things I typed on one of the boards is to ask the question, what else might be true? And yeah. so Janine, when you describe like the people are like stuffing boxes down and they're fighting, like I'm asking what else is happening there, right? Like people don't just behave that way. That is a reaction. That is a, an effect of something else. And so to me, like, maybe you needed to be protected in the moment, but like there needs to be some deep work to understand what's happening in that culture in place. It's pushing those people to, totally. to, to those kinds of behaviors. Like that's not, that's not what people do. Um, I saw such people. I mean, uh, there is a bad people as well. Don't seem like every, everybody is good intention is filled with love. There is a people full with hate as well. That's so true, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> Maybe they don't bring their full authentic self to work that day. Maybe. I don't know. I do want to believe aside from perhaps sociopaths that like people are still good if they are choosing bad behaviors, it's a result of something else. And that may not be our problem to solve, but it's still a good opportunity to ask what else might be true. Um, great. I yeah, Megan, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Janine. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Laura. Now, I don't, is your name really Knuckle Puck or is that the name of your room? Oh, he just signed off. Uh, uh, it was Matthias. Yeah, Matthias. Yeah. Matthias. Yeah. We call, we call him Knuckle Puck sometimes too, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> Have a good one, you guys. Thanks, yeah, Thank you very much. So much.